good to see these young guys up here just worshiping the Lord. You know, it reminds me of when I was in shape. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Amen. Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. We ask the Holy Spirit that he would help us tonight to engage inside of the spiritual war. We ask the Holy Spirit that he would bring revelation to us, that our lives would not be common as men and women, but that we would be anointed to destroy the works of the devil, to pull down every stronghold, and to cast down the imaginations and the lies of the enemy in this world today. We stand boldly and we stand firmly and we stand, Father, with confidence knowing that if you be for us, who can be against us? So now we ask the Holy Spirit that he would reveal Rama unto us that we may engage in Jesus' wonderful name. We ask it. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout. Oh, come on, let's give the Lord a shout with the voice of fire. Hallelujah. You can be seated. God bless you. So glad you are here tonight. I know God's got something for you tonight. You know, as I was praying and asking the Lord to show me some things, he began to speak to me and begin to make some things clear. How many understand that the, that the Lord wants to make some things clear? Amen. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit has come, he will take that which is mine and he will reveal it unto you. Now, you have to be a, 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 a receptacle of that. You have to be able to receive that. You have to be able to walk in that. You have to be able to believe that God wants to engage you in his divine plan. How many know you're not just waiting for the rapture? Hello, somebody. How many know you're not just waiting to die? Hello, somebody. You're not just waiting for heaven. God has you here for a purpose. You were not born in the stone age. Why? Because he wanted you in this age. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm in the right age. Amen. Hallelujah. In the book of 2 Corinthians, I want to talk to you about engagement in the fight. Engagement in the fight. Now, I say that because there's a lot of Christian folk that are not engaged. I meet them all the time. I've seen some today. I met with some today. I didn't meet with them particularly, but I was meeting with, with a, 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 one of the pastors and we we're having lunch, and I can, I can hear the timidity or the timidness in their voices, and they're just, they're just giddy. They're just giddy about Jesus, just giddy about things. And that's great to have a giddiness and have an excitement, but, you know, there's got to be more than an excitement. you got to realize something. You are inside of a war. This is a spiritual war. And if you don't engage in it and just allow the enemy to just walk over you, and just do whatever he wants to do in your life. And then you say, well, God, why didn't you do something? You see, we've got to understand these things. In the book of 2 Corinthians, in the 10th chapter, just turn your Bibles with me there if you can. And in this 10th chapter, I want you to see something that the Holy Spirit is always brought. I guess I've always had a sensitivity to it and, and, and a an acceptance of it. But he says here in, in verse 1 of the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he's speaking to the church of Corinth. And as he speaks to them, he understands something that we must understand tonight, and, and that is that we are involved in a fight. There's a fight going on. And when you became a Christian, all of a sudden you begin to find there, there were people pulling against you being a Christian. Now, when you were a gangster, it was okay. When you were on drugs, it was okay. When you were living out in the street and living with Henry, Henry and Harry, it was okay. But when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden your life began to feel pressure. 
You begin to sense that there was something. Why do I feel this way? First, when you came to the altar, it was giddy and it was exciting. I, I'm, I'm saved. I'm born again. My sins are forgiven me. But now all of a sudden you've engaged into a war. And you've got to understand, the people who don't understand this will not, uh, uh, you, you, you know, it, it's what we used to say in, in the days of, uh, of you know, uh, competition is you, you, don't, you don't go out into the, into the arena with your hands down trying to copy Bruce Lee. How I many of you get kicked out in, in three seconds? Amen. You get kicked out and, and say, well, why did he get kicked out? Why did she get kicked out? And you see this today, a lot of uh, uh, MA fighters and you see boxers who, who will put their hands down and do all this. You got to be careful. You're engaged in a war. And that opponent is trying to hurt you. Amen. Only this opponent that we're dealing with is trying to destroy your soul. Amen. And we have to be aware of this fact that he's not just trying to destroy my soul, but he's trying to destroy the soul of my children, my grandchildren, my friends, my workers, my partners. He's trying to destroy everybody he possibly can if he can have a foothold in their lives. And this is where we have to understand the spiritual battle. This is where we have to understand as God's men and women, we have got to mature and we have got to grow up in this understanding that we're involved in a fight. And this fight is for keeps. This fight is not fair. The devil fights unfairly. But God has given us something. The Bible says, and now I, Paul, myself, in verse 1, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I think a lot of people, they, they, they have a tendency to believe because Jesus is meek and gentle and that his followers are meek and gentle, that there's not a war side of us. All you got to do is read the book of Revelation and you see that meek and gentle Jesus is not the same Jesus that was in the manger. He's coming back with, with, with fire. He's coming back with, with, with a sword. He's coming back to do business. And so the word of God teaches us that we are to be gentle. Meekness is Christ who is in the presence. I am base among you, but being absent, Paul I said, I'm bold towards you. Paul, Paul was a lot bolder in his writings than he was in their presence. And that boldness is there because God puts that boldness inside of every believer. Every believer has to have find a place of boldness where you have, have done all that you can do and you've stood all you can stand and you've been taken all you can take and, and it's time to pop a can of spinach on the devil. How many remember Popeye in the days when Popeye would come out and he, and he didn't took all, he said, I, can, I just stands all I can stands and he pops a can of spinach. Well, some of you got to start popping a can of spinach on the devil, amen. You got to decide you're not going to let your, the devil take your grandchildren to hell. You got to decide you're not going to let the devil destroy your marriage and destroy your children and destroy your health. You got to decide I'm going to stand against this thing. I'm not going to allow the things that are happening in the world to come upon my life and upon my family. I'm not going to just sit by and watch the devil do what he does best. I'm going to stand on the word of Almighty God and I'm going to call the things that are not as though they are. I'm going to decree and declare the righteousness of our God in the land in a time in which the wickedness is moving across the land. A lot of folk, a lot of Christian folk just don't want to be involved. They want to be quiet Christians. They want to sit around in the church, and they want to just go to heaven. So Paul goes on, and he says in verse 2, But I beseech you uh, that I may not be bold when I am present with you, with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. How many know when you get mad at the devil and you get mad at unrighteousness, people are going to think you're in the flesh? I remember one, one, in one church uh, in Salinas, California, uh, 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 the pastor of the church walked inside of the restroom where some man was trying to take advantage of a boy, and he beat that man almost to death. And people probably thought, well, my God, where's the love of God? You know, there's a time to love and there's a time to hate, folks. 
There's a time for war and there's a time for peace. And you better learn how to hate the right things and learn how to hate the devil and hate sin and hate ungodliness and hate wickedness and not embrace it and say that we just have to love. Yes, we have to love every human being. But we do not have to love the sin and we do not have to partake in that sin and do not have to allow that to be part of our life. And here the word of God teaches us, he says in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, that we live in these earthly bodies, we do not war. Now he, I, want, he, I want you to hear this because he is, he is taking us into another realm. We do not war after this flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. That's what he's saying. He says in, in verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare. Somebody say, my weapon. My weapon. Look at your neighbor and say, your weapon. My weapon. How many know we all, we all ought to be packing tonight in this church? Amen. Everybody ought to have a strap on in there. I'm not talking about a physical gun, but you ought to have the word of God strapped on. Amen. You ought to say, if the devil comes in here, boy, I'm telling you what, we're going to cast it out in Jesus' name. The word says here that the weapons of our warfare, and he gives us that indication that we are involved in a warfare. Okay, think about it for a moment. This is why you have to deal with those mind battles and you have to deal with those emotional, you have to deal with those depressions, you have to deal with those spirits of hate and those spirits of lust and those spirits of greed that try to get a hold of your mind. We are involved in a war and the enemy is not playing fair and he is shooting fiery darts at you and he is doing everything he can to distract you. But how many know that God has given us the weapons of warfare where Whereby we can defeat the devil every single hour. Amen? Amen. He said, he said, but the weapons of our warfare are not earthly. They're not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not going to be physical knives or physical guns. He said, the weapon of our warfare is not carnal, but he said, but the weapon that God gave us is mighty through God. Aha, uh -huh. did you hear that? It wasn't mighty because you were a smart Christian. It wasn't mighty because you read the Bible. Not mighty because you, you know, you, 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 you've read all through the scriptures. But it was mighty because of your engagement with God in the battle. And when you attach yourself to God in the midst of your battle, I'm going to tell you something, child of God, you can move a, a thousand. One can put a thousand to flight and two could put 10,000 to flight. Hello, somebody. And when you, when you join your forces together and begin to have a corporate battle, you, you're able to move uh, demonic strongholds and, and evil from um, out of the midst of the church and out of the midst of the city and out of the midst of the county and out of the midst of the nation. You're able to do more. The enemy seems like he's having a foothold in our nation and having a time of taking from us and, and, and taking over stuff and, and, and breaking down the laws and changing laws and changing seasons. And it looks like the church doesn't have anything to do. But I'm going to tell you that's not true. So he says here in verse 5, he says in finish verse 4, in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds are those things that have attached themselves. Now, those things could have been attached for years and they could have been attached just recently. They don't always mean that they're, you know, when you look at the scripture, it doesn't always mean that these things have been there for uh, centuries. It just simply means these are strongholds that have attached themselves to God's people. You ever had something attach itself to you and you said something, did something? went somewhere and you thought to yourself later, why, why did I do that? Why did I say that? That's not even like me. You ever had road rage where you said something, well, pull over. <laughs> and then you thought later, what was wrong with me? What were we going to do when we pulled over? Pray for him, amen. <laughs> That would be a good outreach, outreach to pull over and they pull over and you say, I was going to tell you that Jesus loves you, that he died on the cross for you, that he's coming back again. He said, casting down imaginations. Now, imaginations are the things that are not necessarily true, but they don't have to be true to affect you. You let an imagination in your heart, you let an imagination come upon you. 
That imagination begins to tell you that God doesn't love you anymore. That imagination begins to tell you that God is done with your foolery. That imagination begins to tell you that no one in the church loves you. That imagination begins to tell you your family doesn't love you, your husband, your wife, your children, your pastors do not love you. It doesn't have to be real to affect the mind of an individual. And, but we have to understand that this is how the enemy fights. He fights unfair yeah. to pull you and to pull at your emotions and cause you to feel as though God has given up on you. But I want to tell you, God has not given up on you, that God has a plan for you, and that plan is good, and there's no evil involved in it. Yeah. And so in the word of God, he says, casting down the imaginations. And he says, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What is that? Anything that will lift itself against the word of God. You know, there, there, there's so much today in the news and in the media, so much today about gender identification. But what are you? I'm binary. Binary, okay, what are you? Well, I'm not a he or she or them or it or it or that or there or those. <laughs> well, what are you? I'm spat. <laughs> you know, and what happens is they have taken the word of God and God said in his word, and every believer needs to hear this, God said when he made him, he made male and he made female. <laughs> Now you say, well, well, well that, that's not fair for those who have gender, gender dysphoria. Well, I'll tell you something. When you go into the DMV or the, or the FBO or anywhere else, and it has a little place on there, you go into the medical center, and you have a little place where it says, are you male or female? It doesn't have anything else because they don't even believe it. But they want you to believe it because this is an assault upon God and it's an assault upon the word of God. And if a Christian, if you are a child of God, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, you have got to make the word of God the final authority within your life. You've got to say, God, did what you said in this word is what I'm going to believe. Now, that's not going to be popular. People are not going to like you. They're going to be angry with you. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. I think, it's, I think it's natural for people to be angry with me when I'm engaged in a war with them. I don't think the enemy across the enemy line is going to be like, well, we're, we're happy with you today. No, I, I don't think that because we are in a war. And you understand something. In a war, we're not, we're, we're not to become mean and we're not to become nasty. We're not to become wicked. We're to become righteous and we're to do that which is right before the presence of God. And when we do that which is right before the presence of God, one of the things that's right before the presence of God is to preach the word of God and to declare what God said in his word. And when you declare what God said in his word, it makes people angry. Like when Jesus Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That makes folks angry. Are you saying that Jesus is the only way to God? Are you saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Yes, baby, I'm saying that Jesus is the only way. He is the only way to God. He is the only way to heaven. He is the door by which if you are going to go in, you have got to believe that Jesus is the only way. Now, that hurts people's feelings. But it usually hurts the feelings of those who are on the opposite side of the war. Those of you that are in Christ, you agree with that. You stand upon that. But the enemy is trying to persuade some of you that we shouldn't be so difficult. We should be more gentle. We should be more inclusive. But listen carefully. God wants everybody to be included. He's brought inclusiveness to everybody. He says, whosoever. That's what he said. And the very word is, it means whosoever will believe can come. Whosoever will take upon my yoke, can I will lighten their load. Whosoever will be born again, I will, I will give them entrance into my heavenly kingdom. He did not exclude people. 
He does not exclude people. It doesn't matter what a person's sin is. It doesn't matter what a person's outcome is or what a person's lifestyle is. God includes everybody. But one of the other things that God's word does is it, it, it tells us that we have got to repent. We've got to come to where we change our heart and change our mind about this lifestyles that we live. So he says here the casting down the imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge which is against the word of God. And this is what's happened in our land recently. They have exalted themselves against the word of God and have said it doesn't matter what the word of God says. It doesn't matter what God says. As far as we're concerned, there are thousands of genders. And I don't get mad with folks. You know what I do? I say, well, I give you the first two and you give me one, male and female. <laughs> and you know what they do? They say, well, we, I don't want to talk about it. You know why they don't want to talk about it? Because there is nothing else to say. And if you say what I just said, they get mad at you. And they want to say you're a racist and you're a bigot and you're hateful. And it's not true. But see, folks, we cannot be moved by sympathetic lies of the devil make you feel guilty about something stop listening to that cast it down exalt God's word above all the lies bringing into captivity that means arresting everything under the authority of the word of God now if you do not have that that mindset then it is impossible for you to engage in war because you're going to live not by what thus saith God. You're going to live by what you feel and what others think about you. And this is where we get in trouble when we start saying, well, I hear what you're saying, Pastor Miller, but I believe God loves everybody. I agree with you. His word says so. And I believe that we shouldn't judge anybody. I believe you. The word says judge not lest you be judged. But the Bible also says let you the spiritual judge all things. And you judge all things based upon what God already has judged. The Bible says the prince of this world cometh and Jesus said he's already been judged. See, God is not going to one day decide to send the devil to the lake of fire. It's already been decided. The Bible says that God is not one day going to send the lost whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life to hell and lake of fire. It's already been decided. God is not going to judge anything else. He said, I will not judge you in that day. He said, but my word will judge you. And this is where the child of God has got to get a grip on this thing and understand something, that if you're going to win this battle, you have got to have stability upon something. You cannot just be one of these loose Christians that flow from church to church trying to find something you want to believe. You've got to decide what you believe. You've got to stand on the word. You've got to put your feet down on the word of God and say, I believe this book. I believe everything this book says. Now, if that hurts you, if that offends you, if that breaks my friendship with you, that's not my intentions. I love you, but I must stand with Jesus in this hour. It takes boldness. And this is why Paul was accused of being overly bold. And so the word of God teaches us, it says to bring into captivity. What does that mean? It means to arrest everything outside of truth. Don't let, somebody, don't let somebody come up to you and say, well, you know, like the Bible says, God hates, helps those who helps himself. I look at them and I go, that doesn't say it in the word of God. That's a lie. God does not help those who help himself. God helps those who cannot help themselves. Amen. Amen. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Yeah. Oh, well, you know what I mean. Well, you know, like the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. No, the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. But see, the enemy wants to twist it. Because if you don't perhaps know it, he can persuade you. Because half of what you don't know is, ha is moved on by half of what you feel. Half of what you don't know is moved on by what you feel. Well, I feel, I feel it. I mean, you can feel something today, but the morning you'll say, my God, what have I done? See, the word teaches us 
that we, in verse 6, are to have a readiness in our minds. That we have prepared our minds for this battle. That I'm not just fighting for my own self. I'm fighting for my family. I'm fighting for my daughters. I'm fighting for my granddaughters. I'm fighting for my son-in-law. I'm fighting for his family. I'm fighting for their family. I'm fighting for my brother and his wife. I'm fighting for you and your family. I'm fighting for your children and your grandchildren to come. I'm fighting for the generation that's going to come. I'm fighting to stand the ground no matter what. I'm fighting because I know that this fight is worth it. It's worth it. You look at your children, you ask yourself the question, are they worth it? Or are you going to just roll over and let the devil have his way with them in, the, in this secular society? Having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is complete or fulfilled or established. That's what it means. You establish what you believe. If you're not sure what you believe, then open your Bible and start studying it. Don't just read through it. Study it. Amen. Find out what you believe. Yes. Find out what you believe about the blood of Jesus. Yes. Find out what you believe about salvation. Yes. Find out what you believe about holy living. Yes. Find out what you believe about godliness. Find out what you believe about righteousness. Woo. So that when you are ever questioned about it, you are established and you have a readiness to confront all disobedience. Yes. Let me say these things. The battle is real. Can somebody say hallelujah? I know that. Amen. Hallelujah. This thing you're involved in, brother, sister, I'm telling you, it's, it, it, it's a battle. Some of you battle every single day. And some of you battle particularly on Sunday mornings. You want to come to church, but all of a sudden, man, I just, oh, it's just so much stuff happened. You battle on Wednesday nights. I want to come to church, but oh, you don't understand things are happening. You want to do right. You want to go to Bible study. You want to be involved with the church, but it's like, oh, I'm so busy. And you have to understand that this is nothing more than a battle. This is an attack and assault of the enemy to keep you so preoccupied with stuff that your spirit man, spirit woman cannot receive that true life and that true word for freedom. The battle is spiritual. Anybody believe that? Say amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This is a spiritual battle. Now, sometimes it manifests over into the flesh, but, but, but most of it is spiritual. And then the battle is ferocious. It's, it's, it's a ferocious battle, man. It, it, this thing that's going on. And I mean, these, these people that are uh, killing people and killing babies and Abortion, I don't understand how any man, woman, can say that they believe in the sanctity of life and God had gave us that life. Life is from God, it's a gift from God. God has spoken his word, he gave the commandments, he said, thou shalt not kill. And yet we come to a conclusion that we, we agree and we disagree. And we don't see anything wrong with it. And if they would tell you what they were doing with the fetuses that they're aborting, you wouldn't believe it. You say, oh, that's conspiracy, is it? You see, the Bible says the love of money is a root of all evil. There's a lot of stuff happening, folks, that is not tonight. We're not going to talk about it. And a lot of stuff happening in this world that will flip your mind out, it will change the way you thought because you're so sweet and so innocent and so pure in heart that you can't imagine that people would be so evil and wicked to intentionally kill people, and they do. Mm. But we don't want to believe that because we want to we have our sanity. <laughs> well, the sanity comes from Christ. The battle is pure evil. How many believe that? Say amen. The battle is demonic. How many believe that? Say amen. amen. The battle is in your face. Somebody believe that? Say amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And the battle is destructive. So, in the Word of God, the Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, verse 7 and 8. This is what he says. He says in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, verse 7 and 8, 
uh, he says, and even things without uh, life giving, uh, without life giving sound, whether piped or harped, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? He says, unless. Uh, Unless you give a distinction, unless you make a, a declaration that we're in a war, the people won't know they're in a war. They're just thinking they're having a bad day. They're just thinking it's just a political wins, it'll pass, and another political, and it's just going to be all right. Because they do not believe that we are in a war. Half the people in the church do not believe that we're in a war. Well, Pastor Mello, we don't have to go all that negative and all that. No, listen, this is the word of the Lord. And you know what the, what the Lord said to me? He said, I want to build warriors that learn how to fight. Because when you are attacked and assaulted by the enemy, is not the time to learn how to fight. How I many know you better learn how to fight before you get in a fight? <laughs> you know, in the fight trying to figure it out. Which way do I swing? Who do I kick? Do I bite someone? I mean, you know, you have to learn these things. And so where do you learn it? You learn it in the house of God. You learn it in church. You learn it from pastors like me who will put into your spirit boldness and strength and tenacity. And then it says in verse 8, he says, and, and for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, what does he say? Who shall prepare himself for battle? You know, what's the purpose of coming and gathering? What's the purpose of the church? So that we can gather and feel good that we've gathered after we leave and we have our pastries and fellowship and, and, and we see our brothers and sisters and we give the hugs and the kisses. It's good to see you. See you next week. Is that really what we're here for? We're here to say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Show me what I need to know so that I may win the battle that I'm dealing with. You know, it's an amazing thing. I hear the testimony of some women who, who who's husbands committed suicide and they say I never knew that he was depressed children who commit suicide I never knew they were depressed isn't it a wonderful thing to have the Holy Spirit who tells you stuff so the Bible says that prepare himself who shall prepare himself for battle now think with me for a moment the battle, what is it? It's a battle for the souls of humanity. The church, that's you and I. Someone look at somebody and say, you're the church. The church is called by God to engage. The church is not called by God to hide away, to stay in the cave, and just wait for the, the smoke clears. God did not save you so that you can hide away. He saved you so that you can be part of his engagement inside of the battle that's real. The battle is for the souls of your family. You've got to one day come to reality and get serious about praying for your family. They're only a way to hell, and, and you're saying, well, just come to church. It's not church they need. It's Jesus they need, and you need to have a breakthrough in this thing and say, God, save them. God, deliver them and set them free. The church is called to, to engage with the enemy and to pull down his works. How many believe Satan is working in this city? How many believe he's working in California? Oh, we know he's working in California. Amen. Everybody knows he's working in California. Amen. How many know he's working in America? How many know he's working in the White House, in the outhouse, in the back house? The Word of God teaches us that we are called not to stand by and watch it. You know, I, I, I'm that kind of person, and, and I miss all the fun. Some people get the fun. You know, they get people, uh, they see things. But when I see things, 
that are wrong or violent or, or hurtful, unfortunately, I want to get involved. Okay, if I see somebody trying to snatch a purse from a little old lady, I'm not going to say, well, ooh, that's bad. I'm going to stop that joker. I'm going to say, look here, bud, that, that's not right now. You know, I'm going to stop it. And my wife always said, oh, dude, you're going to get yourself hurt. You're going to get, oh, you know. Yeah, and there's a lot of risk involved when you're involved in the war. But there's something about God's people that hates injustice hates unrighteousness, hates wickedness. See, when I grew up, everybody raised you. Anybody can spank you. My mom would tell Miss Wilson and Miss Wilson, you see him act up, you can pull out your belt and you can beat his little butt. And when he gets home, you tell me about it, I'll beat his butt again. Hello. You ever had your mom tell you that? I had a mama like that. And so, so, but today, don't touch my child. Don't say nothing to my child. Your child's acting up like a fool. But don't say that about my, you know, and people don't want anybody to be involved in their child. And then when something happens, they say, well, why didn't you catch my child? Well, it's not my child. It's your child. <laughs> See, the word of God teaches us that we're not called to stand by and to watch or to isolate our lives from trouble, we're, but we're called to be prepared to enter into warfare against the devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, just quickly turn there with me. Be sober. That means be alert. You know, don't be intoxicated with the world. Don't be intoxicated with stress. Be sober. Well, well how do I get myself sober in a time of pressure? Folks, this stuff that we're dealing with is temporary. We're passing through this world. Yes. The only reason we're still here is because we're still on assignment. Amen. Amen. So be sober. They used to sing an old song years ago, I'm so glad trouble don't last always. And trouble's not going to always last, brother, sister. So be sober. Don't let the devil tell you this is your lot, that this is your life, and this is how it's going to always be. Be sober. If I live, I must live right. If I die, I must die right. Hello. And so whether I live or whether I die, I'm going to live for the Lord. Amen. Amen. But that's a sobering thought. Because we, we, we understand that this is a temporary life. So the word of God says, for be vigilant, be ready. Don't go in not knowing which way to punch. Be vigilant because why? Your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion. What, what is, why does, why does uh, 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 Peter put that there? It's because the ferocity of the enemy, the wickedness. He doesn't care if you're a young man. He doesn't care if you're a young kid. He doesn't care if you're an old lady. Come on, how many old men and old ladies have been knocked down by these thugs and robbed and hurt and shot? Because they don't care. This is a wicked, ferocious assault. And the way we combat it first off in first hand is we combat it by speaking the word of God against it and, and praying and sometimes fasting. This guy came into this, this uh, place to rob this, this store to rob this woman. This was on YouTube. You know, you get a lot of stuff on YouTube. Get it while you can get it. And she's on YouTube. He comes, comes in there and he tells, pulls a gun out and he says to her, give me your purse. And one lady, she hands a purse to him. And the other lady says, I ain't giving you my purse. I didn't work too hard for what I got. Okay. You, lady, you're going to give me your purse. I'm going to shoot you. She goes, I bind you, you devil in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus against you. I cast the devils out of you. And that boy began to shake and quake and he fell to the ground and received Jesus Christ as his Savior. Why? Because somebody knew how to do battle. Oh, I wish the church would know how to fight. I wish they knew how to fight. Don't let nobody scare you. 
I told somebody today, I said, you know, until you, until you have died to yourself, you have not learned how to live. As long as you're alive and you're not dead to yourself, you're always afraid of what somebody might do to you. Now give me a wallet, I'm going to shoot you, I'll kill you. Oh, glory, hallelujah. You're going to send me to heaven. Glory. Come on, baby, put it right here. He said, Mama, you crazy. That's right, I'm crazy for Jesus. How many hear what I said? People that are afraid are because they're living their own lives. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep that he may give up so that he cannot lose what he cannot lose. Give up my life. I cannot keep it. But what I can keep, they, I cannot lose. But I, you know, I'm not saying go out here and be suicidal or crazy. Go out and ask the homeless person to hit you in the head with a bat. Now, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about standing against the time in which we live. So he goes on, it says, the devil seeking whom he may devour, verse 9, whom the Bible says what? Resist. Yes. Now, how do you resist it? Again, I'll tell you, you don't resist it by trying to, trying to do knuckle fights and kicks and screams and shoot them. You resist him primarily by speaking the word. Yes. That thing that's involved in that young man or that woman is a demon spirit. You begin to speak the word to it. Say, devil, I bind you by the blood of Jesus. I come against you. You know, son, God, God's going to deliver you right now. Uh, son, God wants to heal you. Come on, right now. I, I can sense by the Holy Ghost where you were but five years ago, and I sense it right now. The Holy Ghost tell me, and that person will say, my God, there's an anointing on that person. Now, now, you've got to learn how to fight like that. Don't go out there and practice tonight. In whom you resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I want to read you something. May I read you something? You guys have a picture of, of the guy. Uh, uh, this guy is uh, Naimola. And, and uh, I don't know if they, if they got that picture up there, but they'll, they'll put it up. This is a, a story about a man named Martin Naimola. He was part of the German army. So... So this is the dude here. This is a real guy. And it says Martin Neimoller was born in Westphalam, town of Schipstad, Germany, in January 14, in 1892. In 1910, he became a cadet in the Imperial German Navy. With the outbreak of the war, one in 1914, Nim Moller was assigned to a U-boat of which he eventually appointed the commander. Under the stipulations of the ceasefire of November 11, 1918, that ended hostility in war and World War I, uh, Neimoller and others commanders were ordered to turn over their U-boats to England along with many other. Neimoller refused to obey this order and was as a consequence discharged from the Navy. In 1920, he decided to follow the path of his father and began seminary training at the University of Munster. Neimoller enthusiastically welcomed the Third Reich. This, is the, this was, was Hitler's group. But a turning point in Neimoller's uh, political sympathies came with a January 1934 meeting with Adolf Hitler, uh, Neimoller, and two pro uh, 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 proponent, uh, uh, true prominent, excuse me, prominent Protestant bishops were pastors to discuss the state's pressures on the church. At the meeting, it became clear that Neimoller's phone had been tapped by the Gustavo, the German secret state police. It was also clear that the Pastors Emergency League, PEL, uh, which uh, Neimoller had helped found, was under close state surveillance. Following the meeting, Neimoller would come to see the Nazi state as a dictatorship one which he would oppose. And here's one of the very famous quotes of this man here. He says, is best remembered for this 
number one quote. He says these, and I quote, uh, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. You know, well, what is, he, what is he saying? That if we do not learn by history, we are condemned to repeat it again. And I see a lot of Christian folk don't want to get involved in the politics. But the nation is going to hell in a handbasket because of the corrupt politicians and the wicked stuff that's there. And they're changing laws against your children. And you're not going to say anything until they come knocking on your door to take them away. And what God is saying is the same thing that's happening in the church. The church doesn't want to talk about sin. Doesn't want to talk about wickedness, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism. It don't talk about that because we don't really have any problem with that. We don't have any problem. But what happens when they convert your children? Come on, Pastor. What happens when they mandate that your children have to listen and watch and they have already taken these kids to, to these clubs where they can see transgenders do their business. And one of the transgenders of that time stood up online and said, we don't want those kids here. What we do here is wicked. What we do here is nasty. We take drugs. We have sex in the back. And we don't want those kids to be here. Keep your kids at home. We get enough blame already. That was, that was from someone. You see, Nymoller understood something. That God has not called the church to be quiet. God has not called the church to be sweet and, and, and just let everybody like us. But God has called the church to understand that the weapons that he's given to us are given to us for a reason. And we have got to stop trying to be sweet. That doesn't mean we have to be mean, but, but stop trying to be controversial, not controversial. It's impossible to live godly lives and not be persecuted by people. Because those that are godly look weak. They take our godly lifestyle for weakness. We stand in our nation today between red and blue. We've allowed the devil to divide us as families. There are people who walked out of this church because I was not on this side or that side. Well, what should I have done? Compromise? I still believe that these immoral things are wrong. Amen. And I will preach it until I die. Amen. Oh, you'll never be able. I, listen, folks, I'm only trying to do the will of God. I'm not trying to do anything else but the will of God. Let me give you one last story and let you go tonight. It's 8 o'clock, 8, 17. I say the word and the name Esther. The Bible says in Esther, the fourth chapter, in verse 13, and Mordecai commanded the answer, Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. You see, what happened is a decree has been made that the Jews were going to be annihilated and they were going to be killed because they were the poison of the land. And Esther was a Jew, but she was also a queen. And she was inside with the king. And here Mordecai said to her that don't you think that to thyself that thou shalt escape. And what happens in our minds as Christians is that we think if I shut up, they won't come to my house. If I just comply, they'll leave me alone. It's not true. This is a spiritual battle. We're fighting against the hordes of hell. And we have the upper hand because we have the weapons which are mightier than them. 
So Esther in verse 14, and if thou altogether holdest thy peace, this was Mordecai telling her, you know, I understand this, chickadoo. You can hold your peace because you got it pretty good. But as soon as he knows that you are a Jew, he going to kill you too. He said, don't think that thou, if thou hold thy peace at this time. Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews, what? From another place. How many believe that if you won't do it, God will use somebody else to do it? If you walk out because you're offended, God will bring somebody else up in here that will help do the job. Oh, I'm talking to what, this side of the church or that side of the church? He said, deliverance arise from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? How many believe you were born for this time? Yes. How many believe that, that, that we need to get busy about spiritual engagement? And I'm not talking about going out and marching with signs and causing fights and getting riots going. That's not what I'm talking about. Because the battle is not out there in, in the physical street. The battle is behind the scenes. When you look at the White House, I want you to know something. God loves those people in that White House just as much as he loves you. And we have the tendency to think, oh, God hates this person, God hates that, and God don't hate anybody. He loves everybody. But yet we know that the forces behind our nation today is evil. And we're not going to change it by storming the Capitol and by going in and arming ourselves and shooting the police. That's not going to get it, from, folks. That's just evil upon evil. The evil of, of, of the unrighteousness of man does not work. The wrath of man doesn't work out the righteousness of God. But where we can start is like Esther here. Thou art coming to the kingdom for a time such as this. And Esther bade them Return to Mordecai with this answer. He said, go gather all the Jews that are present in Susan and fast for ye, for, uh, for ye, for me, and eat neither eat or drink three days, night or day. I also and my maids will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, because it was against the rule, now it had been changed, she couldn't just walk in anymore, unless the king put his scepter toward her, she would be killed, even as queen. So she was fearful, I can't go in, he passed a law. And, and, and she was gonna hide behind that. You know, the Bible says, if I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, she says what? I perish. Now, now what is she doing? She, she is saying that she has come to a place in her life. And I want you to hear me on this. She's come to a place in her life where her life no longer belonged to her. You know, the problem in the church is, is our lives in many cases belong to us. We don't want to get in trouble and we don't want to lose what we have and we don't want to cause problems. I don't either. But when we, we kept our church open during this pandemic, there was a lot of flack. There was a lot of flack. You can't have more than five people. You can't have more than this. And we kept it open. We kept recording. Some people would come. Some people wouldn't. But now these pastors are asking me, how can I have your boldness? Well, the Holy Spirit gives you that. And my, my desire for you is that not that you would get in trouble, not that you go out and start a fight. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when the time comes to stand for what's right, will you stand? Or will you have practiced defeat so long that it's easier to just say, I can't do it anymore. Jesus is no longer giddy to me. You see, I'm in this thing to meet him one day. I'm not in this thing because it feels good. I'm not in this thing because Jesus is sweet and he's neat. I'm in this because I love him. And I'd rather be there than here. But I'm only here because I have an assignment. That doesn't mean I'm suicidal. It just means that Man, my, my true heart is there. I want to be with him. 
And so here, Esther had to make a decision. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. The church of Jesus Christ must not remain silent Amen. when it comes to certain moral things. Amen. It's not that you're trying to change sinners to believe what you believe, but you're standing on the standard of God's word and you're declaring righteousness. Because when they come to a place where their lives are empty, they're going to remember a woman and they're going to remember a man who had righteousness and boldness. And they're going to come back to you. And I have seen that happen time and time again. So we must declare war on our knees in prayer. We must declare the word in the atmosphere of our world, our schools. Don't sit around and bellyache about the school board. Get rid of those monkeys. Vote them out. Go in with such force in your own campaign and get a, a political party behind you and go vote them out. That's one way of removing them. Then we must take the fight out of the church into the battlefield. Where's that? That's on your job. That's in your family. That's in your houses. Stand firm with righteousness. Fight a good fight of faith. And, and love everybody in the midst of fighting. This is the word of the Lord. God speaks so clearly, so, so much that when he was speaking to David, facing the battle, he said, when you... When you hear the sound over the trees, that's me over the mulberry bush. Go when you hear a sound. Don't go before. When you go, remember this. The battle is not yours. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. And you're just a warrior inside of his camp. And one sweet, marvelous day, he's going to say, well done. And he gives us so much encouragement. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I shall make you a ruler over many things. So don't give up. Don't get discouraged. How many know that God's going to send a God's going to send an avalanche to this nation? God's going to send an avalanche to this nation because the foundations that we see have been built on evil wickedness, but God is removing the foundation. And it's not for you to go in and blow up anything. God's removing the, the foundations. And what's gonna happen? The Lord is gonna shudder it. And the earth is going to shift. And when it shifts, it's gonna come all down. They're gonna be running from their own lies. The media that's for them are going to now turn against them. Because God is not done fighting yet. And we're part of the army of the Lord. Come on, give God praise. Give God glory. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet just for a moment. Father, I pray for these thy sheep these precious ones. Bless them, Lord. Sustain them. Encourage them. And Lord, heal those that are fearful and are concerned about their precious life. Heal them like you did for Gideon. We are warriors, Lord. And it is our desire. You are our king. And your will is our desire and wish. Teach us how to fight. Teach us how to fight in our prayers. Father, I cover these men and women with the blood of Jesus Christ right now. I cover their families and their minds and their marriages and their children right now with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I send forth now warring angels, Lord, 
to lead them and guide them and show them to take up the front ranks as we push through demonic strongholds. We break them off of our capital, off of our nation, off of the White House, off, off of Congress and off the Senate. We break these evil strongholds by the blood of Jesus we command it. I break the evil strongholds over the mind of these young people to become immoral and indecent, perverted. I bind that thing in the name of Jesus. I command it to lift off their minds right now in the name of Jesus. And I release, Father God, your standard of righteousness upon the church. Give us your divine grace. Keep us from evil folk. Keep us from the evil one. We ask and plead the blood of Jesus. We pray for our city. We pray for La Mesa. We pray for San Diego. We pray for California. Lord, let your landslide move through California and clean this filthy land up, God. I pray, God, that your landslide would ro roar through Hollywood in the name of Jesus as they create pollution and confusion. I take a stand against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men everywhere. I stand against the churches that will not preach the gospel. These pastors who are weak and feminine, God, remove them and put men and women in place who will do the job. If they won't do it, God, you've got somebody else that'll do it. In Jesus' name. Now, I cover, I cover your houses with the blood of Jesus. I cover your marriages with the blood of Jesus. I cover your bodies, your health with the blood of Jesus. And I release the healing virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ upon us. In Jesus' name. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. And that's just a that's just a taste of prayer. Amen. You guys get here and you can come on Saturday mornings with Lee and Susie and the team and they're praying. You can get with them. They're, they're into warfare. We're into warfare. Amen. We're into battling. And we want to see this thing happen. And you young people that are kind of like, oh my God, he's he's kind of crazy. Oh, I pray you get this. I pray you get this craziness that you get bold because you're crazy for sin. You'll try anything once. How about try Jesus all the way? Oh, come on, somebody. If you're not born again, you must be born again. The Bible says this, except your man is born again, you cannot enter his kingdom. If you're not born again, why don't you ask Jesus to come into your heart right there where you are, here or where you're watching today's uh, stream from right now in the name of Jesus pray this simple prayer heavenly father I confess to you that I am a sinner please forgive me I am sorry for my sinfulness I ask Jesus to become my master and savior in Jesus name amen and if you believe that you can shout with God with a voice of triumph hallelujah Man, I have preached for how many years? Boy, I've never sweated. I'm sweating tonight. Is something off? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, glory to God. I hope you received that message today. And uh, come on up here. Let's close out a word of prayer. Come on.